Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I've entitled what I'm going to say tonight, Health and Social Care Reform in a Cold Climate, with apologies to Nancy Mitford, um, because we are uh, in 2010 in a year of amazing events in the United Kingdom. Some of them were surprising, some of them were uh, pretty predictable. Uh, it was pretty predictable that there would be an election, and it was pretty predictable that Labour would, after 14 years in power, would lose that election. Uh, it was surprising that the Conservative Party didn't uh, uh, win with a clear lead. And so we had an amazing 10-day period of what could only be described as flailing around, uh, and ended up with this thing, a coalition of Conservatives and Liberal Democrats. A coalition government is pretty unheard of in the UK, so it's a very untested set of territories for us. Um, nevertheless, in spite of the slightly unusual political outcome, uh, the immediately following announcements about NHS reform were utterly predictable uh, for the very reason that the, the Shadow Health Secretary, Andrew Langsley, had been the Shadow Health Secretary for five years. So he'd kind of been round the block quite a lot. Uh, and unusually for a, a minister or a shadow minister, he'd had uh, unshaken backing from the new Prime Minister, David Cameron, um, throughout that five-year period, and indeed before the election uh, result was announced, we knew that if the Conservatives uh, won that um, Andrew Langsley was going to be the Secretary of State for Health, which is a pretty unusual set of uh, sureties. So I suppose we ought not to have been as surprised as we were about what he then did. Because what was surprising, I think, to everybody was the implications of the scale and the pace uh, at which he chose to move. Uh, and we were also, I think, really fundamentally in our hearts taken aback that the kind of theoretical stuff that Langsley had expounded over the last two to three years in the run-up to the election, which um, was more a statement of intent uh, rather than a evidence-based, thought-through set of policies. Um, we were very surprised that he was going to try and put those into place for real uh, at breakneck speed. So what are the key elements of the reforms? Well, first of all, um, fundamentally, the, 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 the key uh, values and principles of the NHS would be retained, that it would be a comprehensive service, free at the point of use, based on need, and that there would be a continuation of the split between purchasers and providers, which had been a feature of the system for 20 years. Um, a further element of the reforms was really a, a key focus on well-informed patients being at the heart of the system and involved in shared decision-making with health professionals. So the slogan is, no decision about me without me. Uh, and that implies also the delivery of good information and uh, good access to information and to allow patients to make informed choices and the commitment that there would be for them choice of provider, choice of consultant, choice of GP practice, and indeed choice of treatment methodology. So it's a pretty sweeping set of guarantees for patients. At a system level, the voice of the patient was strengthened uh, through there being enhanced requirements for both providers and commissioners to engage with the public and with patients, and through the establishment of a new patient consumer body called Health Watch, which would operate both nationally and locally. A third element of the, of the new system uh, is a total revamp of the commissioning arrangements. Um, the responsibilities that were previously exercised by primary care trusts are going to be handed over to these new local consortia of general practitioners who will have a responsibility for commissioning for the future. They will plan services for their registered list of patients. They will contract for these services. Uh, and the aim of their planning and contracting will be to produce uh, improved health outcomes. The, the GP commissioning consortia uh, are almost indescribable at the moment because there is to be no set pattern. Uh, they will be self-generated uh, and there will be no prescription about their size or the, the way in which they will carry out their work. They will be judged uh, and held accountable only on two parameters, the health outcomes they produce and their financial control. So it's a thousand flowers will bloom territory that we're in at the moment. 
Um, the oversight of these GP commissioning consortia will lie with a new body, another new body, the National Health Service Commissioning Board, which has been set up or will be set up deliberately outside the Department of Health uh, and uh, with a real uh, emphasis on limiting the powers of ministers uh, to interfere in the day-to-day -day operation of the NHS. Now, I have just seen a small fat pink thing fly past the window. <laughs> um, because you know better than I that uh, when there is some ghastly scandal in healthcare or when the money has gone completely out of control, the idea that the minister will sit quietly in his office and say, well, the NHS commissioning board is responsible for that, talk to them, is equivalent to pigs flying. Um, so one of the corollaries also of this new commissioning structure is that not only will the primary care trusts who up until now have commissioned disappear, but also the regionally based uh, strategic health authorities who were the regional manifestation of hierarchical management of the health service will disappear uh, and there will be no longer a hierarchical management system. A fourth factor in the reforms is about the provider market. There's going to be a diverse market of providers. All services currently run by the NHS will become independent foundation trusts. About half of them are currently in that status with greater freedoms and independence. And they can be joined by, and again I quote, any willing provider. Um, so the aim again is to have a much more diverse and fluid market in healthcare services uh, and a thousand flowers again blooming. The providers in that market will be regulated for market entry and for economic viability and competition issues by the economic regulator called Monitor and for quality of care by the Care Quality Commission. So in theory it is absolutely a market economy. A fifth element of the reforms um, are a very welcome commitment by the government to prioritising public health and prevention. And this is going to be done in the context of a focus right across this political agenda uh, by the coalition government on uh, localness and on more democratic accountability at a local level. Uh, uh, and so the democratically elected local authorities, the municipal authorities, are to be given the lead in public health and also a very new coordinative role uh, to bring together and promote the join-up of local National Health Service services, social care and health improvement. Uh, and they'll do that through a, a, a locally coordinated joint needs assessment uh, and through health and well-being boards being established at a local level. So there is a real shift towards having locally democratic, accountable authorities being in the leadership role for the integrated packages of health and social care services. A sixth element of the uh, review and the reforms is, again, a very welcome one in principle, uh, a focus on outcomes rather than processes right throughout the system in regulation, in commissioning, in the payment systems for both uh, commissioners and providers. Uh, and these outcomes will include clinical outcomes, patient reported outcomes, and patient experience. And both the providers of services and the commissioners of services will be expected to deliver, as part of this outcome philosophy, 150 condition-specific quality standards which will be set up by our National Institute for Clinical Excellence. Uh, and the top-down uh, national targets, and I shall now have to wash my mouth out with soap and water, um, which had been the order of the day up until uh, the election, um, and in my belief had produced improvements which were valued by patients in reducing waiting times, for example, um, targets are now a dirty word. Um, and outcomes have replaced that. So that, I, I think, is to some extent welcome, though I do have my doubts about the disappearance of national targets. So what are we seeing? We're seeing a number of buzzwords that could kind of typify the reforms. Localness, democratic accountability, outcome focus, 
diverse market of providers, informed patient choice, and the GP at the center of the spider's web uh, uh, on behalf of the patient and the local authority with a coordinative and integrative role. But of course, all of that was made more complicated by the fact that there were a couple of other surprises waiting in the wings. And the first one was the greatest financial meltdown since the Dark Ages. Um, we now in the UK have a major financial austerity program. Um, that is what cuts are now called. Um, and the comprehensive spending review, which was announced on October the 21st that Cathy referred to, uh, though it gave considerable protection to the NHS compared with other public expenditure areas, only really gave it modest real growth, uh, less than 1%. And of course, you know as well as I do about the pressures facing health systems across the board. Uh, in the UK's case, our, our growth population is increasing. Uh, it's getting older. Uh, we have more complex chronic uh, disease. Medical technology is producing pressures. Uh, and all of that is made worse by the fact that the austerity program is also uh, resulting in major cuts in social care. So the impact on emergency admissions, on inappropriate admissions, on bed blocking, will increase the pressure on healthcare apart from the intrinsic pressures already in the system. Um, so less than 1% per annum growth is really not a great outcome, though it was much better uh, than other spend areas where we've seen reductions of anywhere between 25 and, and 40 percent in the public service budgets. On top of that, um, well as part of that, the NHS is being required to make 20 billions in efficiency savings. This is on a budget of about 100 billion. Not to allow that money to be taken away, but to meet those pressures. But it is going to be required to be delivered and shown to be delivered, and then decisions made about its reinvestment, rather than simply some sort of fudge of, well, do what you can with the money you've got. Uh, and it will be very de deliberately targeted towards meeting the pressures and supporting improvements in quality and in outcomes. But at the same time, as a result of the austerity cuts, the NHS is being required to reduce its management costs by 45%. So the folks who are going to do all this are going to start disappearing at quite a fast rate on that basis, I would suspect. So the climate is pretty cold to be tackling a root and branch heroic programme of change. 